Hi guys, hope you're well and welcome to the show and today I'm going to be talking about my state of the collection. Now I'll be honest, this year, 2022, has been the wildest year for spending money terms of watches. I've bought four absolute stonking watches to add to the collection um, before I sell some because I've simply got too many. I thought I'd go through what I've got available. Now, just to put a bit of clarity out there, I have got a ton of other watches. I've got three citizen watches, one that I got married in, which is a little bit dated and even the wife doesn't mind me what, not wearing it anymore. A, a one that I got for my one year anniversary, which I absolutely loved at the time. Still love it now. It's a little bit busy. It's a 43 mil. I just don't get my wear out of it, but that is the one that I'd wear out the most. And then <laughs> bizarrely, when I went to Geneva for my birthday a couple of years ago on the plane home, I got a Japanese quartz citizen. Not your ideal souvenir, considering where I went, the home of watches almost. But yeah, I won't talk about them today. And then I've got a ton of watches that I've also got from the YouTube channel. Think, Luckily, I've got to keep these after the review. And I've got a ton there that I'll go through in a later video. But I'd stick to my core watches that I class as my expensive watches. They're all watches that I paid for apart from one or two, which were gifts. So yeah, let's get right into it. So as you'll see, I'm not wearing a watch today because they're all just down here and I'll, I'll show you them in terms of what I got first. And I'll go through a couple of good points, a couple of bad points. I'll try and keep this as quick as possible. So the first one off the bat is the Amiga Globemaster. It's a 39 mil watch, tungsten bezel, absolutely stunning. They call it officially a silver dial. In most lights, it's a white dial, but yeah, it does catch a bit of a silver hint from time to time. Arguably my most comfortable watch out of the lot. A couple of things that do annoy me, although I love the design of the bracelet, that there is a little gap in between the top of the bracelet that you can sometimes see. And that gap there is the only one that you'll see around the entire bracelet when you're wearing it. So I don't know if that's a design flaw, but it's just something that picks and annoys me a little bit. You could argue that butterfly clasp, no micro adjustment. I've had this watch about, I've had it under two years and the clasp actually broke on me last month and I had to get it repaired. It was replaced free of charge, brilliant by Ernest Jones. But yeah, it shouldn't really go after two months, should it? So that's the Amiga Glowmaster, which I thoroughly enjoy. Next on the list is the Hamilton Interstellar. Now, I've had this watch. It was a gift from my wife and my kids. They surprised me with it. Love the movie. I've got a daughter called Cooper, who was the main character in the film. Uh, and I love this watch. It's a day-to-day, -day, uh, 70 or 80 hours power reserve display case back. Really slim profile. I don't know why I don't get more use out of it. And the only thing I can think is, it's just that the other watches are maybe a little bit more prestigious and a little bit more expensive and I'll feel a little bit better on the wrist. But this holds its own. Trust me, it does. Uh, negatives is that it's a 42 mil and it's a hell of a lot of dial on that 42 mil uh, so it can sometimes be seen as a little bit of a too big a watch to wear when i've seen it on photos back of me it looks absolutely perfect in size basic clasp but ultimately for the money about seven eight hundred quid it's an absolutely stonking watch and i love it to bits next up is my trusty bremont s301 this is the one just before the the more popular gmt version came out but this was a little bit less money I don't really need a GMT version, and I absolutely love it. Now, good points about this is it's a Bremont. It's got the triptych case design. I absolutely love those things about Bremont. I love Bremont as a whole. Uh, negative is that I think Bremont's a bit like Brightly Navitimes. They almost look better on the leather bracelet or a NATO, and I think it's the same with this. I've got the, the leather uh, steel bracelet with it, but I think... It could be designed a little bit better. There's no taper. Uh, the clasp is a little bit basic. Just the same quality as the Hamilton, in all honesty. Uh, only 38 hours power reserve, which isn't great. But the ceramic bezel, the vintage vibe that you get from this watch, the timekeeping accuracy, and the overall looks are absolutely fantastic. At 40 mil, it's a really great size as well. And I get to a lot of wear out of this watch. So those three watches I've had for between two and three years. I think the Bremont I've had about a year. The rest about two years. Uh, then we're on to the watches that I've got this year alone. Now, if you don't know, I've so moved home. We're in a temporary accommodation where we're living now, but freed up a bit of money to buy some serious, serious watches. And the first one, my best watch, by a country mile in terms of looks, prestige, cost, everything, is the Rolex Datejust 41 two-tone on the Oyster bracelet. An absolute stonking watch. I got it for £50 over retail, so I think I paid £10,350. Part of the thinking was that 
I didn't want to pay massively over retail in that price bracket. Uh, possibly a Rolex Submariner No Date. Possibly a Rolex Yachtmaster 40mm. Uh, the, the stainless steel version blue dial with the, uh, the bezel and the Jubilee bracelet would have been one of my choices. But they're all way over list. And it's a little bit gut-wrenching to do that. But they're the prices you've got to pay. So I went for this. I always fancied a bit of a two-tone watch. And it does not disappoint. It does get a little bit scratchy on the polished bits. That's a bit of a negative. Another negative is it's extremely fucking flash. It's a massively look at me watch in a certain degree. And, you know, in some situations it works really well, but I find off more often than not that in other situations it's not quite right. Maybe around family members, maybe around customers at work. Uh, it's not quite right. In an ideal world, I would love to wear it all day, every day. That's what I wanted from this expensive watch, the most expensive watch I've ever bought. And the only way I'm ever going to buy another watch of that value is if I sell this in another watch and buy that watch. So iconic brand, iconic date, just two-tone, very iconic. But yeah, there's a couple of things that maybe think maybe I should have gone stainless steel. And if I could do a straight swap for a Rolex Submariner, the newer one, the 41 bill, That'd be a real contender, but I don't want to lose any money. I don't want to be out of pocket swapping that watch because it's frigging the dog's bollocks. So when I bought some at So Flash, I wanted some subtle, simple, easy to wear, go anywhere, do anything. And that's why I bought the, the Breitling Navi Timer 8. Now, it's 41 mil. It's only got an ETM movement in, so it's only a 38-hour power reserve. That is definitely a downside. Uh, the clasp is very, very basic. But the bracelet and the clasp itself is an extremely comfy watch. It's an extremely good-looking watch. Plain, simplistic design, which you can't often say about Breitlings. Well-proportioned, which you can't always say about Breitlings. And there's nothing not to like about this watch. And is it ego? Is it the fact that I bought an expensive Rolex? Why it doesn't get enough wrist time? Ultimately, it cost two and a half grand from Ernest Jones in the pre-owned section, but it was stickered up, it was brand new, it just didn't come with an official Breitling warranty. So that's why I got a discount on it, I think they're about three and a half grand ultimately. But for me, I could just, I mean, the Globemaster is all brushed and it's like a 6,000 pound watch. You can tell the difference in quality between the two. And if I wanted something basic and tooltastic, I could almost lean towards the Globemaster because it's a predominantly all brushed finish. Doesn't get the wear it deserves really. Uh, so not the chopping block, but I do need to try and get a little bit more wear out of it, if I'm honest. Then on the back of that, where it wasn't quite the, the simplistic tool watch that I wanted, uh, the wife pulled it out of the bag, we freed up a little off runs from the house, and I now got myself a Rolex Oyster Perpetual, uh, Oyster Perpetual Grape Dial 39. Bit of a story behind this, when I had a bit of money when I was in Geneva, this was in the shop window, the only frigging Rolex you could buy for the last five years in the shop. And I nearly bought it and I didn't, and I always regretted it. And grape dial, purple dial, it is a bit freaky. It's a bit unique, to be honest. But once it's on the wrist, it, it blends in. It, it's not really a big deal. And it's it's a really comfy watch, really well-sized, really enjoyable bit to be able to wear a simplistic Rolex without it standing out like a sore thumb, a little bit like the date just does. So this does everything. Uh, I bought it for £6,400, which is fucking ridiculous. I think it's about, it was about 4700 in the shops originally. Uh, no box, no papers. Comes from a very reputable dealer, which is great. But when I got the watch, uh, I think it was Charles Fisher bought it from down London. Uh, it was running way too fast for a chronometer. So I sent it back. They regulated it. it took a couple of weeks. Total ball it, waited around for it. But it's sorted. It's running a lot more accurate now. Uh, but... They have got a very minute speck of dust on the dial between the four and the five. Now, even when I look for that dust, I really struggle to find it. But then when I do find it, it just it pisses me off way more than it should. I don't know why, but this is almost more enjoyable to wear than the Rolex date. Just it's comfy, it's easy, under the radar. You can wear it with anything, go anywhere sort of vibe, but it's still a Rolex. So yeah. That bit of dust really does piss me off. And then just before we went to Turkey in the summer, all these are awesome watches, but I just wanted that summer vibe watch. And the best part of buying a watch is the hunt. 100%. If you can go out there, look online, try them on in shops, know that you're going to buy a watch and the, the world is your oyster at that stage. So it's really good fun. And I came back to a watch that I absolutely adore now. I have owned previously and it's the Seamaster White Dial. I've had this a couple of months 
And it really is a go anywhere, do anything watch. It's still got a lot of things that annoy me about it. The clasp is too big. The bracelet's too chunky. I wish it was still a 41 mil. The helium escape valve I could do without. But ultimately, it's such a good watch that I can forgive those things. And actually, it's a great watch on a NATO. It's a great watch on a, a rubber strap as well. I've got the Zealand rubber straps. They work a treat on this watch. And it's just so frigging good looking. The wave dial is a lot more subtle on the white. Uh, the black ceramic bezel works a treat. Really crisp, clicky movement. And this could be a do anything, go anywhere watch. Now, I've worn it to the gym, I've worn it on holiday, I've worn it in the pool, I've worn it for a restaurant. So it works in a lot of dimensions. And I think that is it's definitely not my best watch, but it's probably my second best watch. Uh, so that's it, guys. Seven watches, seven days. I could wear one a week. I don't. I tend to wear one for three or four days, wear something else in the evening and then change them out. But that's it. My state of the collection, what needs to go, what needs to come in. If I'm really honest... I could be open to selling one or both of the Rolexes, but I'd have to definitely get at least one Rolex back in the collection. I could be open to selling the Bremont and the Breitling. I do want to bring another Bremont into the collection, though. The Seamaster is definitely staying. One of the Rolexes is staying. The Hamilton is staying. The Glowmaster is staying. Things that I'd like. I do like the Amiga Speedmaster. I definitely want to experience a higher-end Grand Seiko than I have previously. Uh, don't get me started. I'll be here all day. Right, guys, that's my state of the collection. Let me know your thoughts, and I'll see you in the next one.